McGillicuddyan Murders Pawn Shop, Season 2, Episode 18, Prison Break. October 10th, 1921. Continued. What? I said. You had to be a night enthusiast to get into the secret entrance. But Noble walked right past me before he had a chance to explain. He couldn't stay near me and have a conversation. He had to pretend that he didn't know me, that he was scared of me. He kept walking. I groaned and watched him go. To hear that little teaser of horrible news, and then wait. It was infuriating. We couldn't get through the doorway. What were we supposed to do, become night enthusiasts? For a moment, I very seriously considered giving up. The night enthusiast leaders would just have to stay inside wooden train cars forever. But of course that wouldn't do. I couldn't leave them there. Even if I had to run out in plain sight of Wrath, I'd still try to get them free. But we needed that secret passage. If Wrath saw me at all, he'd know what was coming. He knew I had the power to undo his spell. He'd shoot me before I walked three feet. Vaguely, I rehearsed schemes in my mind, of me being rolled into the cave inside a barrel, or tucked into a coffin. Or maybe I could go in wearing a bubonic plague mask. How could everyone else get into the cave without arousing suspicion? Our plan barely worked with the secret passage. In my mind's eye, it seemed to fall apart in my hands the moment the secret passage failed. If we couldn't enter the secret passage, then all was lost. But we weren't night enthusiasts. I couldn't see a way around that. I wanted to ask Noble what he had done before. He'd tricked the night enthusiasts into thinking he was one of them. He'd never killed part of his soul, but they believed that he had. How had he done that? And could he do the same thing now? I was making plaintive eyes at him, desperate for some more information, any kind of good news. I wanted to know if he had a plan, anything. But at that moment, the police arrived. The police. Being arrested is awful, and it shouldn't happen to anyone. I, I know we need to lock real criminals up, but we should do it by somehow managing to never arrest them. Everyone stares at you like you're an animal, and the police are rough, and all I can say is, I was grateful I was a girl, because I think they might have hit me if I wasn't. Police are supposed to be knights in shining armor, coming to our rescue. But I think they're just angry, tired people who want to let off steam. Humanity can be such a grumbling mess. Well, I was escorted into the back of the paddy wagon, and news of my arrest must have spread like, well, speaking of the bubonic plague. People ran after the police car. They pointed. I'd had some vague hope of teleporting out of the back of the car, but of course I couldn't. Police officers stared at me the entire time. Not to mention, I was being stared at through the windows. For some reason, I'd been picturing the sort of wooden van you put stray dogs into. But I was a person, so I had to sit in the back of a police car. There would be no teleporting until I was alone in a cell. I knotted and unknotted my hands all the way to the police station, and I told myself over and over that you can't kill someone without a trial, and I wasn't about to be taken straight to the electric chair. Which, as you probably know, diary, is that rather new form of tortuous death that doesn't always work the first time. I didn't even know if they would kill me. Maybe they'd send me to a mental institution. I pictured padded cells and gibbering, horrible housemates. Calm down, I told myself. You can teleport. You can get out of anything. But what if I was under 24-hour surveillance for the next ten years? I couldn't teleport or they were looking at me. But I could escape, no matter what. Everyone blinks. Even so, diary, magic powers or no, it was pretty frightening to be finally arrested. I felt a pang for my old life, for my public image that was being dragged so disgracefully through the muck. When we rolled up to the police station, I was shaking, and I couldn't stop. They escorted me upstairs into, yes, oh heavens yes, a private cell. They locked me in and walked away. The only trouble was, the guard across the hall kept staring at me. I couldn't get out quite yet but at least there were no burly-armed miscreants in here with me. I stepped up to the far wall and looked out the window. There were real, honest-to-goodness bars in the window, and I clutched them and looked out mournfully, feeling a tad dramatic. As I looked out and surveyed the scene, there, down on the street, was Noble James. He paced back and forth on the sidewalk. I stuck my arm out through the bars and started to wave. He still didn't look up. He just stalked up and down the sidewalk with his hands in his pockets. I felt like an idiot for waving at him, my arm like an eager snake sticking out of the bars. But I didn't know how else to attract his attention. I was afraid if I yelled, the guard from across the hall would come over and shout at me. Noble finally looked up, 
and his face brightened. I pulled my arm back through the bars and smiled at him. He gestured. He pointed at himself and then at me, looking hopeful. I frowned for a second, but as he continued to gesture, I realized he meant, Is the coast clear? Can I teleport up there? I glanced behind me. The guard was still there, looking at me with a sour and somewhat creepy expression. I turned back to Noble and gestured an emphatic, No. Then Noble started gesturing something very complicated, and I started to laugh. We must have looked ridiculous. Me up in the prison cell window, looking down on him. Him down on the sidewalk, energetically making motions so complicated they didn't make any sense. I couldn't figure out what he was talking about. Then I heard a scuffle behind me. I turned and looked. The guard had gotten up to walk down the hall. I felt satisfied, delighted, the way you feel when you finish a good meal. I teleported down to the sidewalk, next to Noble. Hi, I said. Come on, he said. We should probably get out of here. He grabbed my hand. Let's go to my apartment. We can talk there. Uh, here's a picture. I glanced down at a snapshot of Noble's apartment, so I would know where to teleport to. I felt absolutely giddy. Diary, have you ever been arrested, glared at, stuck in a cell, and then teleported straight out onto the sidewalk? I was looking up at myself from below, an impossibly magic girl. We still had problems, of course. The entire city was about to be thirsting for my blood. A prison break that was impossible to explain? I would be hailed as a bogeyman for the next century. I was the stuff of legend. Noble teleported, and I teleported right after him. We arrived in his apartment. The lights were out. It smelled like mint and pipe tobacco. Noble turned on a lamp, and we sat on a small brown sofa together. We talked hurriedly, in low voices. We've got roughly twenty-four hours, yes? Noble said. Something like that, I said. The way I see it, he said, we have two problems. We can't get through the night enthusiast's secret entrance. And you're going to be wanted everywhere. You won't be able to show your face. The second we show up near that cafe and try to get into the secret entrance, someone is going to arrest you again. I'll wear a giant grey beard, I said. That's the least of our troubles. How will we get through that entrance? Well, it so happens, Noble said. I know a man who can kill part of your soul for twenty-four hours. We hope you've enjoyed Season 2, Episode 18, Prison Break, of McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop. McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop is written and performed by Minerva Sweeney Wren, all rights reserved. Visit MinervaSweeneyWren.com to see photographs of the real McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop, and learn how you can support the show, keep it advertisement-free, and explore more stories by Minerva Sweeney Wren. McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop will continue with Season 2, Episode 19, The Magician.